Sorry, I'm getting myself situated. So hello, uh, before we begin, I'll do the, uh, con the customary introductions. So my name's Gene Foam and I'm from Nestle Purina Pet Care. I am one of the training managers for our sales organization. So I work across our sales organization with our category leadership, our market development, and our primary sales. Um, the folks that go out to sell to Walmart, Target, Petco, um, all across the landscape of the pet care industry. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. I've been in education for over 25 years. So I've been a high school teacher to an instructional designer to um, a jack of all trades and many other things that people choose to call me that I choose to ignore. Um, so I, I've been in education for a long time and I've had the chance to see the educational landscape stay the same as well as change. But what I wanted to really do today is with the product that uh, Celeration has created and along with the drive for innovation, what we've been able to achieve, but also unlike other presentations where people say, oh, we developed all this really cool stuff. And then all they do is they show you their cool stuff and then they walk away. I'm going to give you a blueprint to replicate it. That if you, if you want to go this direction with this technology, I'm going to give you the steps to replicate it. Because one of the number one questions I get is how did we achieve it? How did we get there? Well, there's no sense showing all the cool stuff if you, if you can never show how to, how to replicate it. So, and as I talk, please, if there are questions, please stop and ask me. I'm not the type of person that chooses to wait to the end to answer all questions because I believe this is a discussion. Anything I can do to help you, is, that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to, you know, to boost my own ego. I can look in a mirror and do that all day long. I'm here to help you guys learn and help you create a stronger sales environment for your folks. So let's talk about how, what training is today. It's pen, it's paper, it's lecture, it's modules this thick that several trees had to die for us to create. You know, it's PDFs that we've never seen. It's PowerPoints. Basically, over the, education has not changed for over 2,000 years. So, when the minute Socrates asked the first time why and started what was called the Socratic method, which was discussion versus lecture, and you flip it back and forth, it's always been the same. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing a new landscape with education. We're seeing a bigger revolution than we've ever seen before, and that's virtual reality. And you're going to hear me refer to it as several different things. And we're actually going to talk about what actually it, for those of you that aren't familiar with virtual reality, what it actually is. And because there are times you're going to hear people say VR, AR, XR. You're going to hear all these acronyms. I refer to it as digital reality. It's importing uh, the physical world into a digital space because one of the biggest gaps we have in sales is being able to practice. Okay, according to CPG standards, it's about 80 conversations with your customer before you're considered proficient. But those are 80, custom, 80 conversations with your customer. Okay, I, I put my foot in my mouth about every five minutes. You give me 80 times to talk to a customer, that's just 80 opportunities for me to blow the sales. It's just the way it is. So we need to be able to create what one of the essential things in education, which is a risk-free environment, an environment where people feel safe taking risks. They feel safe failing. You know, we always like to think about Edison. The, you know, he, he created the light bulb. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into the whole Edison versus Tesla argument. We're going to go with Edison. Okay. Um, nobody likes to remember that the 10,000 times he failed. He didn't do it the first time. Every time we fail, we learn. Because if you think about the true definition of learning and what it really means, when we boil it down to the most essential thing, it's changing behavior from experience. Okay, think about when you were a child and you touched the orange stove. You had no idea it was hot, but you learned real fast from that experience never to touch it again. Experience is what teaches us. It's why we like to say, let's just, let's just throw them to the wolves. You know, let's just throw them out there sink or swim because it's the experience. Now with sales, we've never had that risk-free space. And that's, where, that's one of the biggest things that we see with VR. So as we get into this, 29, we're in 2019. If we think about over the past, I don't know, 20 years, we've gone from CDs to MP3s. We've gone from flip phones that were very, very, very small. Remember they had to get smaller. Everybody wanted the smallest, you know, like I still remember the Verizon Razor. It was this little thing. 
And now we're all carrying around these phablets, you know, these smartphones that have now become our job. But we found a way to innovate it. And right now we're experiencing the same thing. We're seeing technologies that we've never seen before. From drones, um, I don't know if anybody saw, there was a video from uh, Japan yesterday. They actually took about 500 drones and created a man walking across the skyline of Tokyo with these drones. I mean, we're seeing Amazon being able to do single day delivery using drones. Um, we're seeing our Alexas, our Google Homes. I, I mean, ask yourself, how, if, you, if you nowadays talk to your Alexa more than you talk to other human beings. You know, I do. I'll ask her all, questions all day long. But th these are the technologies, so how do we use them? Now, they're not all geared for training, okay? Keep that in mind. One of the bad things we do with training is when a new technology comes out, we get it and we throw it out there and hoping it sticks, okay? We don't think about it. And with VR and with some of these new technologies, we have to be very methodical. We have to be very strategic of how we're gonna deliver it. Because, we don't, because with VR specifically, VR's had over 20 years of false starts. Every couple of years they mention this is the year of VR. You know, um, and so we have to keep that in mind. But the thing is, when you start looking at these new technologies, they're all great. They can work for training. Where I'm getting at is you have to be methodical. You have to have a, a use case that requires that information. And this one is VR, because VR is going to settle that gap. It's going to give us a risk-free environment in order to practice our sales conversations. Sorry, I keep walking away. So let's talk about what VR is. Virtual reality, the digital reality, so there's three forms that you're gonna hear about, okay? They're in the landscape. First one is augmented reality, okay? And let's really talk about what that is. Augmented reality is Pokemon Go. Anything you do with your phone, okay? Because what your phone becomes is a window, a window through. You still are in the physical world, but you're augmenting your, the reality at the moment with whatever's on your phone. That's all it is. It's, it's a very simple type of VR experience. Um, you see a lot of companies utilizing this now for uh, uh, in-shopping experiences, that you can go down the aisle, hold your phone over the aisle, and certain products will just pop out. That's an AR experience, okay? Now we have for, full virtual experience, which this is where you see the full enclosed headsets. Because what it does is it completely disrupts your real reality and puts you in a virtual space. Um, think of the movie Tron. You're teleporting yourself, for those of you that have seen it, sorry, I'm a huge sci-fi dork. Um, <laughs> I don't think often before I speak. Um, so, but what it does is it teleports you into a virtual space. Now, there are some goods and there are some bonuses. You're gonna hear me actually get away from augmented reality. I don't focus a lot on it because it's what got us here. So I'm looking at what's coming, not what we've done. With this headset, we see a lot of bonuses, but we do see some cons. So before I talk about the bonuses, I do want to talk about the cons because they need to be, you need, uh, there needs to be knowledge on it. That with a full virtual environment, a couple things that we have to keep in mind is for people that wear glasses, sometimes they can and cannot be okay. Some headsets make glasses impossible, as well as the ability to get motion sick increases when you go to a full virtual space. If you've ever tried virtual reality and you start feeling a little bit woozy, that's from the experience, and I'll explain why. So in our world, our five senses are constantly feeding us information over and over, everything from our body temperature to uh, people's facial expressions to hearing sounds. When you put on this headset, you eliminate two inputs and replace them with digital. So you're taking your visual and you're taking your auditory and you're changing the signal. So what happens to your brain, think about a computer. You're trying to start too many programs at once, what does the computer do? It slows down and kind of locks. If anybody could tell me what that sound is, I would love it. <clears throat> so, but what happens is your brain can't interpret that signal right off the bat. It has to learn how to take it in. So that's where people begin to experience a little bit of sickness. And for some reason, it typically hits women a little bit more than men. It's not a gender thing. It's just, this is what we've, we've kind of come to notice. The thing I think is it's possibly a height differential, but for some reason, some people are more susceptible than others. But it's a tolerance builder. The more you're in it, the more you can be in it. Um, I can, right now, I can probably go eight to 10 hours 
without even thinking about it. Um, I'm not proud of that. It means I have no life. But <laughs> it, it's what it is. Um, now, the good thing about this is, is that it truly is a different experience. And what it is is, and you hear me say experience. We're not playing a game. We're not opening software. We're not uh, filling out a spreadsheet. We're experiencing something. That, and that, again, that goes back to the learning. Now, where we're eventually going to get to is the mixed reality experience. This is, for those of you that remember Google Glass, this is what they tried for. A mixed reality, which one of the biggest ones is the Microsoft HoloLens. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, just phenom it's a phenomenal piece of hardware, and they just came out with the second one that's just now shipping. But what it does is, imagine your eyeglasses are two computer screens. So what it does is, it actually, in, so like the full headset takes you into a digital space. The mixed reality brings the digital space into the real world to where you can put them on and you can see everything. I'll give you a great example of this is sports helmets, such as motorcycles, um, we're skiing, a lot of the action sports, their helmets have, uh, have integrated uh, uh, visors to where it can actually show you speed, it shows your GPS, who's calling you, whatever song's playing on your MB3. It's feeding you continued information. And that's that mixed reality. You're finding a way to bring the digital real. And we're seeing a lot of power with this one. Uh, the best use case so far I've seen with this is EMT workers. And if you can Google it later tonight, just search Apollo Lens EMT. And what they're doing is when they go address a patient on a 911 call, they put Bluetooth sensors on the patient, you know, like they put regular sensors and those Bluetooth sensors feed into the headset. So now when they're looking at the patient, all those sensors are now working with the um, AI in, on board and it's telling you what symptoms to look for. It's telling you what areas of the body to look for. If you need, a, if it, a doctor, if you need to contact a doctor, the doctor can port into the headset, see through the camera and now has eyes on the patient when, they, when it needs to happen. So this is one of the, these are the things that we're seeing that we can get to. But the problem is up until now, the technology hasn't been there. Our ideas, it's like your, our stomach's much bigger than our eyes at the moment. You know, um, what we're seeing is um, the birth of this technology finally catching up to us where now it actually is a possibility. Over the past three years, VR has grown exponentially. And every day we're finding something new. So as we talk about this, as you start thinking about it, don't ask what it can't do. Start thinking about what it can. VR is an iceberg. We're at the top of it. We have no idea what's coming. And, and right now, what I think is great about it is, right now the VR community is very much a hacker community like the early 80s. We're kind of just kind of piecing things together as we go. Now, I threw in the Oculus Quest because this is the vehicle that's really made this happen. The Oculus Quest, which we actually have one that's set up with the uptick experience I'm gonna talk about, and then I can show a couple other experiences on this one. But the nice thing is you don't need a $3,000 gaming computer to operate it. You don't need to um, have anything special, any special skills, nothing. Not to mention the fact that a it goes from anywhere from $350 to $1,000 is economical. Because for those of us that have to answer to finance departments, Walking, asking for a $3,000 headset for everybody? I don't know about you, but I was laughed out. <laughs> but this is more economical. And the thing is, the Oculus, to give you a little background, Oculus is owned by Facebook. Uh, for about the past six years, Zuckerberg has done nothing but go around and buy VR equipment. Because Facebook is not even on his radar anymore. VR is. He's, he's at, he said he wants a headset in every household within the next five years and he is committed to doing it. And some of the things I talk about will bring back in Facebook. Now there's a ton of different headsets out there. Um, from, I've played with all of them. So what I'm giving you is kind of a summation of what I've learned. Um, if you prefer a different one, that's fine. It's just, we're seeing a lot of growth with this one as well as one of the big things that's gonna come up is how do you admin them? If you give them to every one of your workers, how do you keep track of them? Make sure all the software's the most updated, all that. Oculus actually has what's called an enterprise suite that comes with the enterprise editions that takes care of all of it for you. It's extremely easy to use because that's what VR wants. VR up till now has been a toy. It's been something we kind of play around with. 
We're seeing it grow in, the, in corporations faster than any other segment of the industry. Give you an example, the HoloLens 2 is only available to corporations. Uh, standard people cannot buy it. Um, they just actually broke the haptic barrier where they released what's called haptic gloves, where you could actually put them on and you can feel everything you're touching in VR. I mean, imagine that you're working, you know, you, you have factory workers, they're working a torque wrench, you can actually feel the click, 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 click. You know, um, working in a lab, test tubes can break if you squeeze too hard. Imagine you go in VR and you go like that, and all of a sudden you, you failed. So, but that's what these haptic gloves, and they only sell them to training and development departments. That's it. No gamers can buy them. So we are seeing these companies really kind of go into the corporate space. And why I talk about this is because acceleration and uptick has been, we've been partnering going for three years. And about two years ago, when I started bringing them all this stuff and all these crazy ideas, their response was, let's do it. Because it's about, we saw the power and the value in it. So real quick, just a couple great use cases that you can use VR for. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna focus on one of them. But customer reactions is the first one. Again, being able to create a safe space. Sorry, I'm checking my time. Being able to create, I can talk all night. Um, being able to create a safe space. A place that's safe for people to fail. Think about it. You know, okay, imagine when you're going through your initial training. When you first started your job, they put you in a room with a group of people. And you sit next to somebody, you have no idea who they are. And you have to practice selling with them. The first five minutes you spend laughing because you're extremely uncomfortable doing that. Then you might, then you do a little bit of selling, then you break into a, hey, let's get to know each other type conversation. You know, it doesn't, it's not true to form because there's no risk. You know, you're talking to somebody you know. So how do we create a risk-free environment that gives people that same expression, that same feeling? of actually being in front of a customer. So, to kind of like, so, so far without the VR, so with Uptick, we've been using it for about two years now. And one of the things, and this is the non-VR experience, I've seen, I've seen salespeople that have been doing it for 20, 30 years. So Perina, longevity is, is, in, is, in, is, in, is ingrained into everybody. I've seen people that have done sales for years cuss out a computer avatar, okay? I've seen people walk away upset. I've seen people slam their fists. I mean, and that's just from a non-VR experience because we're seeing that emotional investment. So the customer simulations are vital. That's probably one of the key ones. For us though, as Perino, one was shelf methodology, being able to practice placing things on shelf and having that conversation with our um, customers. As well as virtual factory tours, being able to take people to actually to our factories. Um, Meeting space, being able to meet virtually across any space. In, in other words, we don't need to be physically located. And the last one is uncomfortable conversations. And this is one that we've kind of had some fun talking about over the past couple months. Because we were always focused on the top once. And then a couple months ago, our HR department saw what we were doing with Uptick. And they thought it was phenomenal. And so their first question is, can we practice firing people? Not that Farina goes around firing people, okay? Keep no, I'm not, that's not the message I'm passing. But think about it. When you have to ha fire somebody, typically that's the first time you had the conversation. It's not, never anything you get to practice. Or what about the uncomfortable conversations, ha talking to somebody about uncomfortable BO? I see some people, you know, it happens. You know, so how do you have it? How do you deliver a, a yearly performance that's negative? If you've never had these conversations and people tell you, well, you have to shut emotion off or you have to do this, but if you've never practiced it, you, it's your first time. You're, you, of course, you're going to have emotion. You haven't learned how to do it. And so we really started looking at, so as you notice, all of our use cases are gapped between two things, customer reactions and conversations. And that's where Uptick has become our primary partner because that's, those are the things that we can do. So. If you decide to go down a VR route, these are the things I want you to think about. So for VR, to go into development, you need about six to 12 months of preparation time. It's vital. Don't rush it. To get, define your use cases. Like I said, we had four defined for two years, and then the uncomfortable conversations kind of came up. And we're like, you know what? That actually sounds good but you have to be methodical about your use cases because you have to justify the expense. People that, if you've never experienced VR, the most thing you're gonna get, especially from a finance, is why can't we do it on a cell phone? 
because we're so used to our having our cell phones with us. Cell phones don't give you the experience. Cell phones, it, all they are is just they're a tool. They're not an experience maker. And that takes about 12 months to develop. So when we started with Uptick, we spent probably about 12 months talking about how we want to incorporate it, developing our use cases, and as well as going through the red tape. So, which Perina's red tape it goes half the speed of slow. So, uh, Matt and I always love to joke around to buy because it took about a year to get through because it had to go from St. Louis to Switzerland, which made no sense. So, because our because our mother company Nestle is in Vevey, and so. <laughs> So it was that full time, and then we spent 12 months actually developing. Now, the nice thing is Celeration has already the key conversation set up. And they have uh, one that's for CPG and one that's just for sales. And so we were able to really leverage that, but we were able to look at, okay, how can we do this? How can we make sure it gets, it, we, we deploy it good and all of that? And then took about a year to deploy. So honestly, it's about a three year program. Um, it, it's hard to explain, but here's the thing, and here's why I do it. You don't want to release it when it's half complete because then what people are going to say is it looks terrible and they're going to tune out. The first VR experience has to be great. Think about it. If you've ever experienced VR, think about that first time you put on those glasses. It's like a five-year-old little kid. It's, it's just mind-blowing. But the thing is, I'm glad I'm incredible. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was a huge squirrel. All right, let me get back on track. Um, I thought I had it, but I don't. All right, so, but uh, it has to go full circle. But the thing is, the first VR experience has, has, has to knock people's socks off. So you have to take the time. So like for us, we are in our deployment year. Uh, are not our point. We're finishing our development. At the end of this year, our development is done. And so next year when we release, we're going to have a full suite of software. We're not going to have just one VR experience. We're going to have a multitude to where that headset will become a tool for daily use. And that's the key. Think about when smartphones first came out, it was either for extreme tech geeks or Star Wars fanatics. Because one of the first apps they had was the lightsaber app. And I'll tell you, I wanted an iPhone for that so bad but I was locked into my sprint contract. Um, but we, as we talk about it, so, but once we got our work email, once we got all these different ways to communicate onto our phone that I can now open up my PowerPoints and edit them from my phone, it became a tool. And that's, what, that's where we need to get to with VR. It needs to become a tool. So what I thought I'd do is, so just kind of give you just an example use case. Um, that we went with, which was the factory tour. Um, it was about five minutes, it was about five to 10 minutes of content because here's the thing, when people, first couple times you're in VR, never go more than 15 minutes. Okay, the average first user or early users of VR can only handle about 10 or 15 minutes before motion sickness sets in because it's just, it, for a while, it's just uncomfortable. Like I, the way I always describe VR to people is, it's like water, when you go swimming, you still feel gravity, but if you jump in water, are you gonna hit the ground? No, you just slightly sink. In other words, gravity ceases really to apply when you're swimming. VR is the same way. The physical world kind of ceases to apply, but you have to allow yourself to embrace the experience. And the first couple times somebody's in one of these headsets, all they're worried about is how silly they look because all they hear is laughter, you know? And you have to get past that. So, what? Well, Real quick, I'll just kind of bring this up, if it'll let me play it. There it goes. So this is kind of a brief kind of synopsis of our factory tour. But it was about creating that interactive space. So for this, it was like Purina factories are all graded for, all the foods graded for human edibility. Yes, you can eat all your pet's food for, made from Purina. Whether you want to or not, that's a complete internal conversation you can have. Um, I can tell you some of the new cat treats actually taste not half bad. Because um, yes, we actually have to try them. Um, so, but the thing is, is that it, it creates that experience, okay? As well as it takes them there. And some of the, and this was, and the reason why I talk about this one specifically is this was our first use case. This is the first thing we did in VR. And the things I've heard, first off, this has exploded, okay? 
Facebook is now doing an entire case study that's going to go over several years on this VR experience. Um, it has just blown up beyond, beyond belief on what VR can do. Yes, sir? How do you walk in virtual reality? Okay, great question. So with this, we took walking out of it. It's, what we did is we filmed everything in 360 video. And so it's a very solitary because what we want is, if this was going to be the first VR experience, we want people to sit down. And so that's why we went to this. Now, with walking, um, like our shelf, we have actually shelf VR s software that we can actually walk up to a shelf. We can manipulate it all in VR. Um, and there's two ways you can do it. One is they have what's called guardians, where you can set up your, your play area, basically the safe area around furniture. So if I were to set this whole area, I could actually put a shelf here where I can actually walk back and forth from it and actually pull things up and operate manually, or it's standard video game controls for any gamers in here. So you got a couple joysticks that move you all around. The joysticks will make you sick very, very fast. So I always warn people about those. Um, but that's where, like with the Quest, as you noticed, the Quest, this is all it is. There are no sensors. The sensors are built in. So in other words, you don't have to set anything up. You don't have to make sure you're in a specific space. Um, one, of the, one of the flagship games on this is called Vader Immortal. Okay, for Star Wars fans, you actually get to be face to chest with Vader. Because he's actually about this tall. So you're about right here. And, but the thing is, you can walk through spaceships. You know, if you have a big enough space, like I actually go into my backyard. I, li I live in Missouri. I, I've got woods all around. And my neighbors already think I'm cuckoo. So I'll set up my whole backyard. And so, but now I get to walk through spaceships. I get to fight Darth Vader. But, and so, so that's what we're getting at is that you have one of two options. Um, but, it's, it's, but we're getting to a point to where it's about recreating the physical world. Yes, was there a question over here? Yeah. Yeah, um, so you mentioned value and improving out the value and having very specific use cases. Mm -hmm. I'm curious why you started with the factory tour. Does it actually seem, I don't know if it's the audience, um, what were the overall goals of this specific use case and how did you prove the value and ROI? No, great question, because I will tell you, this was not my first choice, okay? The factory tour, what, yeah. Oh, yeah, so how did we choose the factory tour is our first use case, and how did we discover our ROI, and how did we use this to prove our case? So we actually wanted to start with shelf methodology, because I, I, I'm part of our functional training team, so I wanted something very functional, but the technology wasn't there. We were still working on the software. We were still waiting for the tech. And so as, a, as kind of a placeholder, we're like, well, let's, let's go ahead and just knock out the factory tour real quick. I thought it would be something people would experience and just kind of, honestly, I, I stand so corrected, it's unreal. The person that helped me, put, helped me put this together, I apologize to her all the time. Now, so it just, by luck, we have, this was the first use case. But one of the things we discovered is this was a great introduction to VR because it limits movement as well as we made it all eye navigation to where you look at things to select. So we took out the hand controls completely. So we started looking at it as a way of bringing people in. And as far as the ROI figure, um, this is the way to look at it. We're actually getting ready to incorporate this in our new hire program, which is about 35 people a month we bring to St. Louis. If we were to send all 35 people a month to the factory, let's say an average of $2,000 for plane ticket and hotel. So now we're saving $60,000 a month. Easy. And that's how I sold the, the ROI. Um, now I will tell you, we're still, a lot of VR entities are still trying to figure out a great way to measure ROI. We're still waiting for that light bulb. Um, so if you come up with some, please share it with me because I would really love it. Because um, we're really, because it's hard to get an ROI on experience, especially when it's never been done before. Follow-up question: Do you get uh, pushback from the people who really like that in-person time with the team? It's team building, like for that two thousand dollar trip to. <coughs> no, great question. So the question was: um, Did we get any pushback? Um, from creating this experience rather than having it in person. Um, from the factory, no. Because getting a group of people into one of our factories, one, is extremely difficult because we have to adhere to all FDA guidelines. Two, all of our machines are proprietary. We make all of our own machines. So I can show you a minor brief experience of this, but I can never show you the full tour unless you work for Perino. 
Um, so the factory was completely on board. Um, the big pushback we received was everybody wanted it on this. And I still, I'm still arguing it. This has, been, this has been going for nine months now. People still want it here because they've never experienced it in VR. They're used to working on their phone. The problem is, can you get an idea of how big one of our factory is by looking at it from this and just going like that? No way. It's not an experience. When you're in one of our factories, you will hear the sounds. The only thing you don't have is the smell of bacon strips, which is what they were making that day. Um, now, I have held bacon strips under people's noses as they're in the tour, and you know, it, it, just to create the full experience. Um, but that's the big pushback. Everybody wants it to go to their phone. So if you do a use case like this, you need to get people in the headsets immediately um, because they have to experience it. But to give you an example, when our chief human resources officer went through it, he was only in it for about two minutes, took off the headset and said, this is better than a real tour. We need it now. So, it, so the one of the things is that what helps you it, getting past the ROI is the excitement of being able to create this. And all it takes is a minute in the headset to realize it. Any other questions? All righty. So I've talked about VR a whole lot. Um, now, what I want to talk about is Celeration's role. Ooh. All right. Perfect. So is, is how Celeration fits into this. You heard Nick already talk that be, with the selling intelligence, with being able to help people out. So what we've really looked at with Celeration is when we start talking about VR, it, was, it started off just kind of some crazy conversations. You know, it'd be really cool if we could do this. And so what happened is we, a couple, about, I don't know, about seven, eight months ago, we started actually really digging down and saying, okay, what do we want to do? And so, what's, so what we did is we created a boardroom experience where you're, because most video games, most, you know, like even with Celeration, it's pick your own ending. You're given one of three options to pick, but that's prompting, that's training wheels. Anytime you're prompted for an answer, you know, think about every multiple choice you've ever taken. Two answers are obviously wrong, and it comes down to the last two. And if you're not sure, always pick C. Okay, or you can do the trick my sister and I always did. We got through college this way. Look at your, look at your watch. If the second hand is between 12 and three, the answer is A. If it's between three and six, it's B. And we've passed numerous tests by doing that strategy. I can actually see my sister shaking her head, yes. So, but that's the thing is multiple choice tests, there's tricks. As well as standard e-learning, what do people do? They burn through it, then they write down all the answers, then they go back through it a second time and get their 100%. I mean, if you've done it, nope, nope. I do it. I'm a trainer. Uh, but the thing is, what we wanted is we wanted to get rid of that. We wanted to take out the training wheels completely. We wanted people to, to have their own story. So what we created was this boardroom of three people, and they're going to ask you questions, such as, how long have you been with the company? 10 years. What do you do for the company? I'm a category analyst. But the thing is, the software is going to capture every word of every answer. And it's going to run it through an analytical engine. It'll come up saying, you, are, you said the word um 582 times. Stop. OK? For you know, our other things, like for us, we sell to veterinarian clinics. You know what? You said that product is dead. Never say dead in a veterinarian's office. OK, good rule of thumb. So we're able to do that, but the thing is, we ask these questions and, you're, and the salesperson actually speaks their story. And we transcribe all of it and run it through an analytical engine. But the nice thing is, it's their story. Every salesperson, they, the skills they need to learn, but they need to learn how to personalize their story. And that's what this helped us do. And to kind of give you some stats, this doesn't have the VR in there, but this is gonna show you why we really believed in the VR experience. Because just from a non-VR experience, these are some of the results we saw from our sales organization that we, it's, that's in uptick right now. We saw the average selling, selling judgment score go up by 27%. We saw the selling intelligence score improve by 15%. But here's the thing. So uptick is all role plays. It's practicing the conversations. 
Three conversations had the most improvement. Presenting to a retail group, negotiating, and leveraging. Aren't those three key things that sales always do? Look at the numbers. The average first for presenting to a retail group was 56%. The average best was 71%. So we saw an improvement of 27. But let's now look at the others. Negotiating, very complex. And negotiation is one of those ones you have to just kind of eliminate emotion, you know? Some people are just natural at negotiating. I'm not, I'm too empathetic. I will feel guilty so bad, okay? It's, it's, it's my upbringing, okay? The average first score was 26%. The first time, the average of first time going through the conversation. The best that we saw was 73, but that's an increase of 181% in negotiation, which is vital. Now understand, people that took this course also went through a four day intensive negotiation class before they hit uptick. So after going through a four day negotiation accelerated class, this is high as they were getting. With uptick, we saw that improvement. Because the, because the negotiation training is lecture, discussion, lecture, discussion. We needed experiential learning. Leveraging shopper insights, we saw a growth of 284%, okay? These numbers are unbelievable. The first time Nick showed me these numbers, my jaw dropped. Yes? Um, strange question, or sorry, it's a tangent. No. Um, do you have a, an individual heads up for each person going through this, or is it a, um, something that you have for each training program that you can re recycle through? Now, great question. So. Do we have an individual headset for everyone was the question. So this up until now has been non-VR. So this is just what we're seeing without a VR experience. This is just the, the PC, the 13 conversations that we use from Uptick. But if we're seeing these through a computer, we can only dream of what we're gonna see in VR. And I can tell you from, um, like with, with my side, so our chief HR officer loved our, the VR experience acceleration built for us, that he had us show it to all the HR heads globally to incorporate not only within just our sales, but to take it to outside of Perina into Nespresso, Nestle Waters, to take it globally at some point. It always comes down to that. Yes? Um, so you mentioned the feedback that it gets or it gives participants mm -hmm. through the, um, the experience, who determines that feedback? It sounds very similar to a system like Gong.io, where that system a lot of times leverages the tens of thousands of sales calls that it, it recommends, it does filler words, et cetera, but the dev <coughs> example that you gave was very specific. Yeah, because, we're, uh, because with the admin tool that they created, we're able to, we're able to control that. So I can weight things however I want. Um, I can choose to ha have it specific wording. Um, I can choose basically like what, one of the things that we're doing now is with our VR experiences, we're having some of our really great salespeople go through it. We're transcribing it as, and so now that's gonna become our benchmark. So we're able to load that in the scoring system and try to hopefully replicate it as best we can. And is there, are, uh, are there any present capabilities or future capabilities planned for like uh, AI and machine learning to actually recognize not what we as admins know to be the... the yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely looking at how we can incorporate AI, but we're also looking at how we can recreate an actual experience to where, like for us, a lot of our conversations occur in the pet, pet aisles. So you know what, we would love to be in a pet aisle with a store manager. You know, our, for our vets, we would love to be in a doctor's office with, it, with an actual vet. Um, so we are looking at that as well as looking at how we can incorporate machine learning and some gamification into it as well. Um, the big thing is, is that this is all brand new. Um, the nice thing about VR is one, nobody can ever look at you and say, this is the way it's always been done. I love that freedom. Um, the second is, is it's blanket snow. What, I know, whatever we need to, whatever we want to define, we can define it. All right, so that, yes, please. Is it integrated with Salesforce so there's social proof as far as how those negotiate, how, you know, the uh, people going through the sessions, their results, even just their engagement with the system, results in 
actual improvements in uh, the field? Um, not through our sales force. So um, Uptick's analytical engine and reporting feature, we actually chose not to put it into our LMS or our sales force because it would just give us completion, pass or completion, you know, pass or fail. What we wanted was we wanted the analytics because once they're done with any experience, we want to be able to hand the results to their people leader and say, here's coaching. And this is probably more for uh, the B2C use case anyway, so you're, you probably aren't don't have as many interactions in Salesforce for like past field. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just not there yet. Um, and unfortunately, it's because education, a lot of the stuff has been the same for years. And so where we're looking at really is, and that's why I love our partnership with Celeration is it's innovation. You know, I mean, our entire new, new training program, we instituted it this year. It's all built around Celeration. It really is because you can learn, you can go through as many classes as you want till you practice that conversation. It doesn't matter. And I mean, I was a musician, I still am. It doesn't matter if I know all the parts of a guitar or all the drums that are in a drum set. It's learning the rudiments that make, that make you a player or learning the scales. And that's what we need to create is that way to learn. And so that's our, that's where we get into this. Any other questions? Yes. Once you are in the phase, how long does it take for you to roll out a new course? Um, honestly, the first VR course we created, we actually did it probably maybe a month. But as you get the framework and as you get more comfortable, because our goal was to have, to have these type of conversations. Out, so we have the core, but being able to create one-offs. So like for us, new item placement is huge. Whenever we get a new item, trying to figure out how to get it on the shelves just becomes a nightmare. And so the ability to be able to practice those conversations before we ever need to, or a product recall, you know, or um, any of that. So being able to create those one-off situations, it's, it's a couple weeks. You know, I mean, it really doesn't take much time. So, and that's just the power of what Celeration can do. All right, so I am out of time, but I will be around afterwards. Um, if you have any questions or feel like to complain to me, please, we're free. <laughs> Thank you.